Well, good morning, church. How are we doing? Good. Hey, real quick, I just got to say, man, I just listening to you guys worship and listening to our team, I just got chill bumps because I don't know about you, but that last song, incredible. Would y'all just give it up for our worship team one more time? They do such an amazing job and just so thankful for them. Uh, real quick, before I get started in the sermon, I have a little uh, just challenge for you guys and, and an announcement. If you didn't see in my email yesterday, uh, we have a Suppers and Showers event t- this Tuesday, and we are in urgent need of people to sign up and serve. We have pretty much all the food covered. I think there was still like one item left on there, a small thing, um, but we need about six more people who are willing to serve at the event. And so if you can do that, please go back on my email, sign up for that. We would love for you to be a part part of that. It's an awesome ministry where we bless the homeless. And so we would love for you to be a part of that. So I uh, thank you guys for serving with us and just thank you for being a part of that. Well, let's get started this morning. We're continuing in our series Centered, where what we've been doing is taking the past few weeks to walk through the book of Philippians. And just a little bit of background for you about the book of Philippians, if you don't know. Uh, Philippians is a letter written by Paul, and he wrote it during uh, his time in prison in Rome, and he wrote it to the church in Philippi. And this was actually a church that Paul had started 12 years before writing this letter. And so this is a people and a church that Paul is not only very fond of, but he's very familiar with. And so as he writes this letter to them, Paul is ultimately centering Philippians on this idea of focusing or centering on the gospel. Because the gospel, it is the very foundation of our faith. And so Paul believes and talks about in his letter that we need to center our lives uh, based on belief and action around the truth of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And so in the first two chapters of Philippians, Paul starts off this letter by calling us to be imitators of Christ and calling us to live a life that is worthy of the gospel, looking to Jesus' life and ministry as the example of holy living for us. And as he writes chapter three, he's continuing in this example of centering our life on the gospel. And he's gonna focus on this idea of Jesus being at the center of our life. Because to Paul, nothing mattered more to him than his relationship with Jesus. It was the most important thing to Paul. And so as he writes this letter to Philippians, he is calling the church in Philippi to imitate him as he pursues Jesus. And so it's the same thing that we're called to today. And so what I want to do with you this morning is study this chapter, and I want us to break it down a little bit. And what I want to do is give you three practical principles that talk about what centering our life on Jesus is all about. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can turn to Philippians 3 this morning, and we're going to start by looking at verses 1 through 3 together. And so it said, further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it's a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. Now, if you've been here for the past two weeks, you know that this feels like a pretty harsh deviation from the way that Paul has been talking up to this point. Because for the first two chapters of Philippians, Paul is a little more gentle and loving in his tone, but this feels very harsh and direct. But it's not directed at the church in Philippi. It's actually directed towards a group of people in in Philippi. And that group is called the Judaizers. And so the church in Philippi was dealing with this issue of the spread of the Judaizers. And what these were, these were a group of Jewish Christians who were spreading the lie that faith in Jesus was not enough. That not only did you have to have faith in Jesus, but you also had to keep all of the old Jewish laws and commandments. And so one of the biggest issues that the Judaizers pressed on the Philippians was the idea of circumcision, that every man who was to be a Christian would have to be circumcised. Now, imagine the the welcome gift you get after being baptized by this group, because I mean, you get the cool t-shirt, you get the certificate, and a pair of scissors just with your name on it. But look at some of the words that Paul even uses to describe this group. First, he calls them dogs, which is a derogatory term that Jewish people actually used to talk about Gentiles. And so Paul kind of flips this script on him and now uses this term to apply to these Jewish Christians. And he even goes so far as to call them evildoers and mutilators of the flesh. And at first glance, this seems like a really harsh way to talk about these people, doesn't it? Because I mean, at at initial glance, this looks like a group of people who really are just trying to push people towards obedience to Jesus, right? That's what they're doing. They're saying, you've got to follow Jesus and keep his commands, But the issue with the Judaizers is not their appeal 
to obedience. This group was trying to distort the gospel by saying that faith in Jesus wasn't enough, that your good works were also a part of this. But Paul made the argument that salvation is found in faith in Christ alone. In fact, he talks about it in in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. He said it this way. He said, for it's by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, number nine, not by works so that no one can boast. See, Paul knew that ultimately salvation had nothing to do with us, that it wasn't about what we did, but it's about what Jesus did for us. And so that actually leads us to our first principle this morning, is that it's about faith, not works. It's about what Jesus did for you, not about you. And the issue with the Judaizers is that they're promoting the idea that faith was not the answer. They're spreading the lie that your faith is not what saved you, but rather it was your obedience. And so the issue with the Judaizers is that their obedience was not a response to the gospel, but rather for them, it became a qualifier for their salvation. And this is what we refer to as legalism. And so if you've ever heard this word thrown around, here's the definition for it. Legalism is a dependence on moral law rather than faith. And so the idea here, right, is that for the Judaizers, they believed that grace wasn't enough. Faith wasn't enough. And so what you had to do in order to be saved was to work your way into God's favor. If you wanted to be a Christian, you had to keep all of God's commands. So faith wasn't the answer your works were. And the issue here is that the Judaizers, they're putting their confidence in flesh, right? Their confidence is in their own works. Their confidence is in their own abilities. But see, this is a false confidence because they're basing everything on what they do. And see, this is the main issue with legalism is that good works can never save us. Paul actually makes this argument in one of his other letters. In Romans 3, 19 through 20, he says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, it is through the law that we become conscious of our sin. And so if you're basing your standard of righteousness on God's law, here's the issue. God's law never declares anyone righteous. If you're basing your standard on this law, you need to understand what God's law was created for. God's law was not created to be a litmus test for salvation. The sole purpose and existence of the law is for us to understand that we inherently are not good. We don't meet the standards. Paul says that it makes us conscious of our sin, that it silences us before God, and that no one is declared righteous. And so if you're judging yourself based on the standards of God, you can't be righteous. But see, that's the issue with the lie that the Judaizers are spreading. The Judaizers are telling you and telling Philippians, the Philippians that it's all about good works. It's all about working your way up to Jesus. And see, this is where legalism like this starts to fall apart. Because if it's not based on us, the issue is that legalism tells you that you're in charge of your salvation. Legalism tells you that you are the author of your salvation. And so if you don't meet the standards, eh, too bad. Anybody here ever believed that lie before? Maybe you've been in a place in your life, maybe you're there now, where you feel this desire, this pull in your life to be right with God. But you think that the answer to your sin problem, you think the solution to your sin is doing good things. And so you try your best to do that. You come to church, you try to pray, you try to read your Bible, you start serving, maybe you get in a community group and you start doing all these things, but it doesn't really feel like it's doing anything for you. Or maybe you find yourself in a worse position than that. Maybe you're walking through something hard like addiction. Or maybe you're going through or have gone through a divorce Or maybe you've just got this sin in your life that you can't seem to shake. And there's this overwhelming sense of guilt and shame 
And it leads you to distance yourself from God because you think that you can never meet the requirements to be in his presence. Or maybe you find yourself on the polar opposite end of either of these spectrums. And maybe you're actually pretty confident in yourself. I mean, you think you do a great job. Not only have you been in church since you were a kid, I mean, you're doing all the right things. You give, you serve, you're at church, you tell people you're a Christian, you pray every once in a while. And so based on your own, own knowledge and own standards, you feel like you're a pretty good person. Maybe, maybe you even feel like you're a better person than most people. So why worry, right? I mean, you're probably getting into heaven. Here's the issue. You don't measure up. If you're basing your favor on God according to your works, it amounts to a sum zero. Because you can't be righteous in the eyes of God. See, Romans 6.23 tells us that there is a penalty, a payment for sin. And that penalty is death, not doing good things. And so ultimately what that tells you is that sin has a penalty you can't pay. And see, this is where legalism falls apart. Because if we're the authors of our salvation, and we're writing airport romance novels trying to write a, best time, a New York Times bestseller, doesn't work. But here's the beauty. Here's the good news. Salvation isn't based on you. It's not about you, it's about what's been done for you. And so yes, we fail to meet the standards of God. Yes, we don't make it. We are not righteous in the eyes of God. But here's the awesome thing, is that Jesus came to earth, he lived, he died, and was resurrected as a way to make a way for us. And so what Jesus did is he lived a perfect life on earth. He died a death that we deserved, as a sacrifice for our sins, and he rose from the grave three days later. He not only conquered sin, but he defeated death once and for all. And so in the moments where we don't measure up, where we can't make our way to God, Jesus made a way for us. It's not about you. It's about what's been done for you. See, Paul actually said it like this in Philippians 3, 3. He said, for it's we who the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who what? Boast in Christ Jesus and have put no confidence in the flesh. What's our qualifier for salvation? What's our confidence in eternity? It's Jesus. See, for us, we get to rest in the truth that Jesus' sacrifice is enough. And so here's what we have to do. We have to stop trying to earn our righteousness. And we have to accept it freely through grace and faith in Jesus. All right, let's look at our next verses. These are verses four through six. Paul continues on and he says, though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I've got more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regards to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. So Paul's continuing his thought. Remember that he says we have confidence in Jesus, not confidence in the flesh, right? And so he goes on to say we don't need to have confidence in the flesh. And who better to talk about not having confidence in the flesh than Paul, because if there was a single person who could talk about this, it was Paul, because nobody had the kind of pedigree that Paul had. You couldn't question his Jewish heritage. Paul was a Jew. He was circumcised on the eighth day, which was tradition for Hebrew boys. Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin, which was special because it was not only the lineage that they got Saul, the first king of Israel from, but it was also the tribe that had Jerusalem, Israel's capital within its boundaries. And Paul also calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. And what this meant was that at this point in time, you have to remember that Jews were spread out all throughout Europe and all throughout Asia. And so it was not uncommon for a Jew to find themselves in a different culture and in order to kind of blend in they would actually give away some of their culture, some of their heritage in an attempt to kind of mesh with society. 
But if you were a Hebrew of Hebrews, that meant that you didn't do this, that you didn't give up any part of your heritage. You kept everything that you held sacred and you did it despite the world around you. And that's what Paul was. But on top of his heritage, you couldn't even question his commitment to God because if you wanna talk about somebody who knew what it looked like to keep the law, he says, look, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I was the chief Pharisee. This is a dude who kept zealously all 613 written and oral commandments of the Jewish tradition. And you can't even question his passion because he persecuted and killed Christians when he thought they were the enemies of the church. See, Paul wasn't just a Jewish person. Man, he's the gold standard for what God wanted them to be. And, and to him, man, this is the exact kind of person the Judaizers strive to be. But Paul didn't care. Look what he went on to say in the next verses in 7 through 11. He said, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Paul looks at everything in his life, and he says, doesn't matter to me. That all of these reasons that everyone else would have had to boast, the reasons to brag in his life, Paul doesn't care. These are the very things that he left in pursuit of Jesus because to Paul, nothing mattered more to him than a relationship with Jesus. He looked at his life, he counted it, and he said that Jesus was more valuable than anything else to him. And this leads us to our second principle of living a life centered on Jesus is that it's about prioritizing Jesus above everything else. That Paul looked at his life and he considered every part of it not even comparable to knowing Jesus not even comparable to having a relationship with Jesus. In fact, in verse seven, Paul goes on to say that he considers everything that should be gains in his life as loss because of Jesus. And that word that Paul uses for loss is actually a Greek word called zamia. And what zamia translates to literally is this idea of a bad business deal. And so here's what Paul's saying, is that all these things outside of Christ, Paul considers them a sham. They aren't worth it. But here's the problem, is that we live in a society that tells us the polar opposite. That society tells you that, man, if you want the life you're supposed to have, if you want this fulfillment, you want this purpose, you've got to have that career. You know the career I'm talking about. You've got to have the perfect family in the white picket fence. That, man, if, if you want the life you want, that, that you're called to have, then you need to have more money, more status, more fame, more influence, more comfort, more control, more you. That life is about you. It's about what you want. It's about your priorities. Paul says, man, that's not even close to true. Paul says the things in your life compared to Jesus, they don't matter. And so you have these things in your life that, that may be important to you. They may look great. Some of them may even be the most important things to your life. Paul says they're worthless compared to Jesus. When I was in fifth grade, we actually had our graduation field trip. I don't know if that's just a Mississippi thing, but like when you got out of elementary school, it was such a big deal that you had a party. And so we actually took a trip to San Antonio. That was my first time in Texas. And we did exactly what you're supposed to do with kids in San Antonio. You take them to the caves and you leave them. And so we walked through the caverns in San Antonio. And as a kid, I don't know why I did this. I don't know why I cared about this, but I had an obsession with gemstones and minerals. I don't know why, but I liked them. And so as we navigated our way through this cave, much to the chagrin of the teachers and my mother, I made my way out into the gift shop. And in that gift shop, they had all these piles of different kinds of rocks and minerals. And so I collected a pile of them that I was gonna beg my mother to purchase. And I found this one particular mineral that I thought was really cool. And it's a mineral called pyrite. Anybody know what pyrite is? Yeah, there you go, yeah. If you don't know what it is, it has a common name, it's fool's gold. 
And the reason they call pyrite fool's gold is that back in the days of the gold rush, you would have miners and prospectors who would be digging for gold and they would find this stuff thinking they hit the jackpot. They'd go to sell it and find out it's worthless. And so pyrite at first glance looks an awful lot like gold. But it doesn't even come close to comparing to the real deal. When you start observing it, really, you start to understand that its qualities and its value doesn't even come close to matching up to the real thing. And see, this is what Paul says he considers the things of his life compared to Jesus. Paul says it's fool's gold. It's fake. It's not real. The worth isn't really there. That when he considers everything in his life, he looked at it and said, it doesn't compare. And see, the same thing's true for you. That If you have these things in your life that you're putting ahead of Jesus, Paul would say that's a bad business deal, that you're investing in fool's gold. And so the call for us is to focus and prioritize our relationship with Jesus. And that's not to say that things like your career or your family aren't important, because they should be important to you. But Jesus should be the most important thing to you. Jesus actually talked about it like this in Luke 14, 26. He said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person can't be my disciple. And the point that Jesus is making here is not that you, now that you're a Christian, you need to go walk up to your family and be like, never speaking to you again. The point that he's making is that if Jesus really is the priority of your life, then he takes priority even over the closest of family that this is what it looks like to prioritize Jesus above everything else because he's worth it. And so that's the goal. The goal is that we prioritize Jesus, that if he really is gonna be the center of our life, you gotta put him at the center of it. He has to not just be a priority to you, he has to be the priority. So I wanna give you a couple of practical ways that you can grow in this. They're really easy. The first one is, You've got to cultivate a relationship with Jesus. One of the best ways you can do that is spend time with him in studying of scripture and prayer. Grow your relationship with Jesus by spending time with him. If any of you here are married or been through a relationship ever, you know that if you want to get to know somebody, what do you do? Spend time with them. Same thing's true with our relationship with Jesus. If you want to get to know Jesus better, if you want to grow in your relationship with him, spend time with him. Get to know him through study and scripture and talking with him in prayer. And see, Paul actually refers to this as knowing Christ. And the word that he uses for uh, knowing Christ is a word called gnonai. And it comes from the Greek word gnosis. And it has two different meanings. It means a deep, intimate knowledge or to know through personal experience. And so Paul's point is that if you want to know what it looks like to know Jesus... It happens through this deep, intimate relationship. It's an active, growing relationship with Jesus that we have to cultivate, that this is what's important. But what's awesome about this is that to know Christ is actually our benefit. Paul says that to know Christ is to know the power of his resurrection. And here's what that means for us, that as we grow in our relationship with Jesus, as we experience a life with Jesus, his power changes our lives. And so the more that you know Jesus, the more that you become like Jesus. So spend time with him. I would also challenge you to make church and biblical community a priority in your life. Look, I get it. Life's busy. We got work. You have kids. You got school. You got family. You got everything that gets in the way. But I would challenge you to make time for these things and make them a priority because this is what's important. Don't let busy schedules get in the way of what God has called us to that cultivates our relationship with him. And parents, I'll give you a challenge too. If you want your kids to know that Jesus should be the priority in their life, you gotta show them that he's the priority in yours. And so I understand that there's a million things that go on in life, but you gotta set that aside for Jesus. Don't let your schedule dictate your commitment to Christ. Let your commitment to Christ and your relationship with Christ dictate every other aspect of your life. But here's the deal. Whatever it looks like for you, make him the priority. 
Work to put Jesus at the center of your life. Make him the thing that everything else flows from. And ultimately value a relationship with Jesus above everything else. Let's look at our last verses. These are verses 12 through 16. It's not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do is forgetting what's behind and straining towards what's ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take a view of such things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. So here's one of my favorite things about Paul of all time. Paul is a ridiculously humble dude. Think about his life for a second. A zealous keeper of the law. An apostle. A man who had a firsthand experience with Jesus. Probably the most important missionary in human history. Paul writes in this section that he hasn't hit his goal. Isn't that crazy? To Paul, though, his goal was ultimately that he strives to look like Jesus in every aspect of his life. Now, let's be honest for a second and say that we can admit Paul did a really, really good job of that, right? I mean, for, for Paul, he is probably the gold standard for what we think a Christian life should be, right? Like if we could get to the level of faith and obedience that Paul had, whoo, and we'd be at the pinnacle of who we are, right? Paul didn't think that was true. Paul knew that no matter how much he had grown, no matter how much he had accomplished, there were always ways that he could grow in his relationship with Jesus. And so he wanted to make sure that the Philippians understood this as well. And I love the language that he uses here because Paul says, look, I don't worry about my past accomplishments. I'm not worried about who I was as a Pharisee. I don't really care who I am as an apostle. I don't really care about what I've done and how I've grown as a follower of Christ. Paul says this, he says, I press on towards the goal. Paul knew there was work to be done. The goal wasn't met, so he continued to grow. That Paul strived every single day to look more and more like Jesus and grow in his relationship with Jesus. Paul knew that living a life centered around Jesus meant a constant pursuit of him. And that leads us to our last principle for the day. It's about pressing on. See, I think the danger for us sometimes is that we get really satisfied and content with how we've grown in our relationship with Jesus. And if we're not careful, that leads us to be stagnant. And, and here's what I mean by that, right? I would say most people in this room, you probably have a really good reason to be proud of what, what change has happened in your life. Because there's some of you in this room, many of you I'd even say, who are incredible examples of how God can change someone's life. Because many of you in this room, some of you have walked through addiction. Some of you have made it through really hard situations in your life. Those of us that are working on our faith, man, you have been working to remove sin and look more like Jesus. And it's incredible when you look at your life and think about all the ways that God has changed you. It's pretty neat. But as awesome as it is to look back and see all the ways that God has worked in your life, remember that there's always room for growth. And so the challenge here for us is don't settle. Don't become stagnant in your faith. Don't become so content with where you are that you lose sight of the fact that we are called to grow in our relationship with Jesus. See, a, a life that's centered on Jesus understands there's always room to grow. And if this is who we are, if our life is centered on Jesus, then that means that we have a constant goal in front of us to always strive to look more like Jesus every single day. And for us, I mean, that's an ongoing process. I love the way that pastor and theologian David Guzik said of this. He said that this is where childlike faith meets real maturity. That a child can't wait to be bigger and always wants to be more mature. See, maturity recognizes 
that there's always room to grow, that we're not done. And so the challenge for us today is the same challenge that Paul gives the, the, the church in Philippi here. He says, look, I get that you've grown. I get that you've done a lot of awesome stuff, but no matter where you are in your faith journey, press on. You've grown, but keep growing. That's the challenge that we continue to get better, that we continue to strive towards Jesus, that we continue to grow in our relationship with him and we press on towards the goal. I love the words that Paul uses for press on and strain. They're Greek words that deal with the idea of running a race. And specifically, they're tied to this idea of extreme exertion. And what I mean by that is they pretty much lend to this idea that you give 110% effort at all times. Even when you're at the head of the race, even when you look at your life and you go, you know what, this is the best I have ever been, you keep going. Because for us, if our life is centered on Jesus, we know what the goal is. And we wanna look like Jesus more and more every single day. So that's the challenge, press on. No matter where you are in your faith walk, Paul's challenge is press on. And listen, this will look differently for everyone in this room. Maybe for some of you in the room, you gotta take the first step in growth. And that first step is having a relationship with Jesus. And look, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, today is, is the best day ever. There's no better day than right now to do it. And so if you wanna talk about what that looks like in just a minute, I'll be in the back of the room. I would love to talk to you about what it looks like to put your faith in the author and perfecter of salvation. Or maybe you're here and, and you have been focusing so much and relying on yourself to have confidence in righteousness and forgiveness of sins. And today you need to recognize and understand that it's Jesus. It's through faith alone in Jesus and by grace that you are saved, not by works, but you need to make Jesus the savior of your life and let him be the author of your salvation. Maybe for some of you, it's just that you got some priorities to get in order. Jesus might be your savior, but you gotta make him Lord. Or maybe you're here and, and, and you're growing, you're doing great. The challenge for you would be, man, don't relish in the growth, but keep growing. Keep pursuing that relationship with Jesus and keep going. But ultimately, this is what we strive for, that we fix our eyes on Jesus. Paul says that we are fixed on the prize and we strain and press on towards the goal. You know, in 2008, uh, the Olympic Jamaican sprinter by the name of Usain Bolt set out with a goal. He wanted to become the best uh, fa or a track sprinter in the history of mankind. And so he started that in a really slow way. In the Summer Olympics of 2008, he went and ran in the 100 meter dash and he not only got a gold medal, but he broke the world record. And then just a little bit later, Usain Bolt went to go run in the 200 meter dash and he strikes his iconic lightning pose and he goes on to win another gold medal and break another gold record or world record. And then two days later, dude's still not done, he goes and competes in the 400, the four by 100 meter relay. And that team goes on to win not only a gold medal, but also break another gold, world record. In three days, Usain Bolt found himself at the top of the sports world with three gold medals and three world records. It's pretty good. He wasn't done. Dude had his eyes fixed on the prize. And so he pressed on. That very next year, Usain Bolt went on to a world championship track meet where he actually broke his own world record in the 100 meter dash, uh, cutting his time by a 10th of a second, which doesn't sound like a lot, it's a lot. And then over the next eight years, between the 2012 Olympics and 2016 Olympics, Usain Bolt would go on to win another five gold medals. And after retiring, all said and done, Usain Bolt had broken three world records, including his own world record again, and won a total of eight gold medals, cementing himself as the best track sprinter in human history. By the time he retired, at the end of his career, dude met his goal. 
See, that's the same thing we're striving for as Christians. We're not chasing after gold medals, but we're chasing after Christ. And so for us, the goal is that every single day we would look more and more and more and more like Jesus. And at the end of our life, eternity with Jesus. And see, that's a goal that's absolutely able to be accomplished in Christ. But here's what you gotta do. You gotta center your life on Jesus. That you put your confidence in faith, not in works. That you make Jesus the priority in your life. That you value a relationship with Jesus above everything else. And when you grow in your relationship with Jesus, don't stop. Keep going. Like Paul, press on towards the goal which God has called you heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let's pray.